So welcome to Digital Forensics. Today is the 20th of January. We're going to push back on a discussion and review of the independent assignment 1.3. Um, it is based on a real live scenario. I do have a friend uh, in the condominium association where I live who has a metal detector and he recently discovered not one, but two uh, smartphones, right? So, I mean, this is like double trouble, right? He didn't just find one smartphone, he found two. And he handed, the, he handed these to me and, and then basically asked, okay, what do I do with these, right? And that's an opportunity, a live opportunity to get into some of the initial, you know, our first module in the course is about origins and essentials, right? So if you're gonna get into forensics, what are some things that are gonna keep you out of jail? Yeah. So uh, we will take this up <clears throat> on Tuesday, the 25th of January. Um, but please get this in so I can start reviewing uh, your responses. Are there any questions about the article review? Uh, no. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I just want everyone to be at ease. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is like copy and paste a few summary sentences out of the real article and then try to paraphrase. That triggers a high uh, safe assign score and, and then um, that creates all sorts of issues. Uh, we want if you read the essentials, the assignment document here for the article summary, I make a big splash, a big point of saying, I want your authentic voice, right? So as you read your article, if you just jot some concepts down and then form your own sentences based on, uh, you know, after you're finished reading it, you keep jotting those concepts down, you have a collection of concepts. Well, then you can relate or figure out on a basic sheet of paper, okay, which ones are connected? And that helps you form the, a summary sent, you know, a couple of summary sentences, right? That's it's called mind mapping. If anyone is interested in a deeper walkthrough of mind mapping and how that works, uh, I can do that uh, on the sideline, but that's an excellent way of developing your authentic voice as you uh, develop your abilities to articulate professionally. That's one of the goals of this course. Today, we're going to dive in as fast and as deep as possible with a review of the material for module one. And without further ado, I just wanted to remind you, our, our, our study guide is going to engage the material in a di different manner and using a different sequence than what we cover in the slides. Both are valid, both are important to consider and review. Uh, and as you take another look at the material, both in the slides and the study guide, and that's why they're both included in the references folder for this module, um, it, it's called spiral technique. So we do an overview of things. And then as we get into the other modules, we start getting deeper into some of the same material you saw in module one, right? So, so we circle back around. Think of a shark that takes a bite to bleed out a victim, and then it circles around while the victim is dying, and then it comes in for a bigger bite. That's what sharks do, right? So it's kind of a spiral thing, and that's how we're going to approach the curriculum. I tell you that up front because <laughs> I have had cases at the end of a course where students say, yeah, I was gone for three weeks out of country, but when I came back, that silly professor was still talking about the same thing. I mean, really, what the heck? And I, the only thing I could do was shake my head and say, obviously you were gone three weeks and you don't understand what we're doing here. We're going to introduce concepts for familiarity. Then we're going to investigate them further. Then you're going to apply them and use them. And in each pass, you're gonna get deeper and deeper, right? I just just wanted to be transparent about that expectation. Okay. Any questions about that? No, sir. 
Okay, so our goal today is to get through as much of this as possible and as much of the slides as possible. So we're gonna kind of jump around a little bit. All right, here we go. Yes, yeah, some of the same objectives were condensed and folded into the student learning objectives uh, in the study guide. You need to worry about uh, selected content in the slides, but you don't need to worry about the objectives on the slides. You only need to worry about those that are stated explicitly in the module and in the study guide. That would be the one exception to the slide material. Okay. So can everybody see my screen? Yeah. I'm gonna go full screen here, just so it's a little bigger. I hope that helps. And I'm also gonna put my uh, phone on stun. So, yeah. So there's been a lot going on here and I don't want, um, I want calls ringing in going crazy here. Okay, so digital forensics uh, basically started around the time that computer science started. Uh, in 1984, there was a there's landmark legislation. It's called the Com Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It was one of the first federal laws. And not long after that, it might have been 1983. Uh, but within a year, a graduate student at Cornell University by the name of Morris invented a worm that was the first documented and malicious case of rapid and massive infection. Morris was incarcerated as a result of this, right? Um, I have mentioned in other classes and I'll mention here that when it comes to forensics, there are specific federal, federal standards and federal recommendations that are embedded in a series of special publications called NIST, National Institute of Technology and uh, Science and Technology Special Publication. It's the 800 series, and there are some that are specifically designated for digital forensics. For subject matter experts, for digital evidence specialists, and that is how we refer to digital forensics experts, we use those terms interchangeably. Digital forensic experts are also known as digital evidence specialists. There is an international standard that was ratified globally. It's uh, ISO is an international standards organization based out of Switzerland. And we are a member nation and there are, I don't know how many, over a hundred other nations that participate in ISO standards. It's 27037. The odds are pretty good that 27037 has been updated since then. Uh, in fact, I wanna see if that's the case. One thing about standards is that we're dealing with a moving target in forensics. And that is one dynamic of our, our content, right? I'm gonna go into guest mode here. That's one dynamic of our content that is a real challenge is that it's a, a lot of uh, methods are subject to change even instantly. That's because our adversaries are very savvy, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, they're, some of our adversaries are very gifted and it, can, it is discovered on occasion that a forensic method is rendered obsolete overnight because of new developments in the industry. So, it's always good, or, or they find out that some things are no longer effective. One of the downsides of, so this is how you tell what year. The number of the standard followed by the year it was published. The number of the stand, the um, publication year of the standard follows the standard number separated by a colon. And it looks like uh, this has remained in place. Now they may have something under draft. Um, does everybody see this? Yeah. Something about 2016, but is that the official website of ISO? 
I don't know. No. <laughs> no. Standards.iteh.ai. Mm, yeah. Here's straight from the source. Here's a reference to it. Maybe they're beginning drafts. And this organization is involved in a draft of the updated standard. Or, or it's bogus, right? You see this reference to dollar signs? ISO standards require payment. Uh, you can get posers that basically offer reduced costs on copies. That's a nasty business, isn't it? Just nasty. You saw how I walked through this. I expect you to do the same when you're when you're referencing standards. I want you to go to the source. I want you to validate what the latest version is. If you see references otherwise, right? And watch for potholes. Watch for potholes. It's one of those things. That's one way the adversary tries to confuse. So it's the application of computer science and investigative procedures for a legal purpose involving the analysis of digital evidence after a proper search authority. I, that is the formal definition of digital forensics. However, yeah, digital forensics has broader utility. I want, to, uh, I want to cultivate in you an appreciation for the fact that digital forensics knowledge, skills, and abilities can be used for troubleshooting purposes with an IT department. You can consult to identify what and how something crazy is happening. Uh, digital forensic skills can be used for personnel management issues. It's not always legal, okay? And you don't always have to worry about a chain of custody. There are informal uses or less formal uses, less official uses of digital forensics. Dan, I wanna go back to this again. There are less official uses and quite often more common uses of digital forensics methods that, that don't always get to legal. The thing that I want you to understand in big bold letters is that the unofficial informal uses or private uses for personnel matters, right? Did an employee cheat on us? Did they sell us out and share trade secrets? Are they doing personal stuff on the job, right? Are, are they stealing from us because half the time they're in the office, they're not on task for us. They're doing other crap for themselves, which means that half of their paycheck is completely unproductive time, right? And it's unauthorized use of company use of job site technology is only for job site purposes, right? So what are you doing using all, the, all our stuff for personal business? That's an abuse and unauthorized use. And so there's disciplinary action internally for the organization. Here's, here's, here's where we get back to the legal. Remember the shark, we come full circle. Here's where the shark comes back for a bigger bite. At any time, an informal or private use of digital forensics can quickly become a legal issue, a legal matter. Let's say things escalate in a personnel matter and somebody issues a serious threat, okay? Somebody breaks, somebody borrows funds, right? So here you are doing digital forensics for a private matter and now all of a sudden you have grand larceny. Somebody borrowed $5,000 of company. That has to be reported, right? But how legal is looped in, in a private scenario often includes coordination of legal counsel of the private organization before it's reported. It's not that you don't report. You're gonna have people that hire you that say, oh, I don't, you know, we don't have to report this. A felony? The hell you don't. No, what matters is how you frame the report so that you put the best foot forward for your organization. Somebody is paying you to be a digital forensic expert to help them frame awkward situations in the most beneficial manner and to improve security 
after an event so that it doesn't keep happening, right? But don't anyone, don't, don't ever let someone who hires you, now they may have you sign a non-disclosure agreement and they say, yeah, our legal counsel will handle it from here. They will engage law enforcement and it's up to you to keep quiet about this because you signed a non-disclosure agreement. That's perfectly cool. Okay. Does everybody know what a non-disclosure agreement is? You can't disclose company secrets or something? Basically, you sign saying, yeah, you're not going to do that. Now, in a valid non-disclosure agreement, when the law is broken, you don't have to stay silent. A valid, reasonable, and appropriate non-disclosure agreement says, hey, if somebody dies because of this, oh, I'm going to talk. And I am not bound by non-disclosure anymore. I ain't wearing prison orange for you, fool. Don't ever sign off on a non-disclosure that doesn't include the exception or caveat where the law is broken and the expectation is, oh, in writing, well, but, you know, it's a gag order, basically. And we're paying you, so you got to keep your mouth shut. I ain't wearing prison orange for you. I'm not. You know, we go to the same church, our kids go to the same school, you know, I got nothing but love for you, but I ain't wearing prison orange for you. Everybody needs to think hard about that reality. If you're going to engage in digital forensics and really actually use it, those things can happen and they can happen in an instant. It's important for that reason to understand the rules of evidence and the rules of engagement, and then who the points of contact do are for which purposes. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? No. Okay. So wait, wait, wait. Actually, so wait. So if, if you send a non-disclosure agreement and if something shady does happen, you 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 aren't allowed to say anything. Uh, that's incorrect. You are allowed to say something, but what? A non-disclosure agreement does is it secures your confidentiality, your professional courtesy and confidentiality in appropriate circumstances. And it also provides for expectations where if things go crazy and there's a legal matter that erupts, it, it, it presents, right? All of a sudden now you've got a felony. That changes the picture and a properly drafted non-disclosure agreement provides you with the legal basis to ensure that if a report is necessary. Now, what you may do is say, you know, um, reporting procedures may be handled by appropriate legal counsel, but it has to be promptly reported. Nobody's going to sit on it for a week and think about it, right? That's what legal counsel for an organization is for. So a properly crafted and drafted non-disclosure agreement protects everyone, especially in situations. I'm glad you asked that question, right? And when somebody says, oh, hey, um, yeah, you can't say anything because you signed that NDA, that's when you pull this out, this next screen. Oh, there's law. Again, I'm not wearing prison orange for you, right? So there are proper venues to report such matters, um, some federal, some local, right? So you have in our territory, if it doesn't, if the reporting requirement is not explicitly stated for the territory, but a federal standard exists, then we still have to report it. This is one misconception of people in the US Virgin Islands. We are subject to federal standards where territorial government standards do not exist. Or if there's a more stringent federal standard that exists and a less stringent territorial mandate is in place, the general and more stringent US federal requirement is what matters, okay? That's another misconception. Yes. People say, oh, well, this is US Virgin Islands. Uh, we have a law for that. And it says we might have to report or we simply have to report it to the leadership of the organization. If there's a federal standard that says, uh, no, you loop in federal law enforcement, then you contact the FBI office in the US Virgin Islands. 
again, you do not wear prison orange for anyone, right? So the computer analysis and response team was first formed when? In 1984, about the time that we started getting a lot of computers in the workplace. And many states have rules that map to the FRE, right? So there's, just remember that the more stringent rule, whether it's local or federal, is what matters. You always wanna err on the side of caution. If a local rule is more stringent, you follow the local rule. If the higher level requirement or law or mandate is more stringent, then you go with that one. Any questions so far? Yeah. Okay, now consistent with US, evidence and uh, the privileges of every US citizen is that according to the Fourth Amendment, it's called the Bill of Rights. And uh, according to the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, where the Fourth Amendment is concerned, just like any other evidence, um, we are protected against unlawful search and seizure. So, you notice the caveat here, separate search warrants might not be necessary for digital evidence. So you can have physical evidence and digital evidence and both are important. And if the digital evidence is in the mix, then just a plain old search warrant would cover both depending on how it's written. A lot of it depends on how it's written. In any case, one of the restraints of exercising a digital forensic skill sets is that you can't just go in there and start analyzing everybody's stuff. You can't violate a person's privacy, reasonable, and you can't go into search, you can't search on and seize. Now in the workplace, you can have a disclaimer, you can train your employees and you, you say, is the policy of this organization to operate ethically and lawfully? And we monitor our electronic communications and our data for troubleshooting and quality assurance. And um, the resources of this organization are to be used for the organization mission, not for personal or private use. And we have the right to inspect or review as needed. Now, the other thing happens, the organization does something like that, which is a best practice and it's recommended. And then they, it goes to their heads. The boss in the workplace says, yeah, everything you do at the work site, it belongs to us. It's our property. We own it. No, you don't. Um, you'd be surprised in courts. There have been, there's ample case law where basically an employee on a break, on a lunch break, if an employee on a lunch break is doing something like um, shopping on Amazon or checking flight pricing, with airlines, that's that's not considered to be abuse. And for an employer to be up in everyone's Kool-Aid and reading everything, that's inappropriate. So there's a balance. And in the workplace, it's important to have good policies and procedures up front to set the stage for best practice digital forensics. If you don't, if you don't have that in place, you want to talk to the stakeholders, the people you serve, the organizations for whom you consult, and you want to have a policy that says, look, um, we respect everyone's privacy against uh, and, and their rights against unlawful search and seizure, uh, while the resources and digital equipment that's used by the organization is to be used for work purposes it's appropriate for people to check, you know, to do casual things on their break, provided they're not doing anything unlawful or unethical. Once they're back on the clock, that's a different story. Once the lunch break is over, that's a different matter altogether. Okay? That's where timing makes all the difference. And context makes all the difference. And this is where your senses and your thinking prowess come to bear. The best digital forensics tool is the one that's between your ears. You are not excused from considering context. In fact, 
you're never going to be a decent digital forensics expert or a digital evidence specialist, right? If you don't take into account context and uh, you, you don't understand the limitations. And this is part of the essentials we want you to understand going into this, okay? Any questions about this? No. So if you grab some evidence and it's not done properly, guess what? It's not admissible, right? Now, is it admissible for making personnel decisions? Absolutely. You can fire somebody. Oh, well, it's my bill of rights to express myself and I just didn't like the boss and I was using company email to share my opinion about how stupid that boss is. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're not violating your right to express yourself, but it's not a constitutional right that you work here and that we pay you to be nasty to the boss. There's the door. Show yourself out. That evidence may not be admissible in a court of law for criminal purposes, but it's certainly admissible and it's certainly useful when it comes to personnel decisions. Again, it's just another example of context, right? Does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? Okay, so investigating digital devices includes collecting data securely, examining suspect data to determine origins and content, presenting digital information to courts, applying laws to digital device practices, right? So part of our charter as digital forensic experts is to make sure that what we're doing with forensics is legal and it's within bounds. It's different from data recovery. This is another point of confusion. It's like, okay, you see the IT shop and the tech support to recover your data. When do you engage a digital forensics expert? Well, when there's potentially hidden content, when it's encrypted and you can't open it and you need to, stuff like that, right? So there is a distinction between plain data recovery and um, analysis, which involves Retrieving information that was deleted by mistake or lost during a power surge or server crash. That's an IT problem. That's a tech support problem, not a digital forensics problem. If an organization is so sorry they don't have battery backups and they don't keep decent daily backups, it's not a digital forensics expert responsibility to help them recover data on a crashed system because they're stupid. That's like having a vehicle that doesn't have seat belts in an airbag, right? Yeah. Okay. And there are organizations that are just that, just that blindsided and they're just that cheap. They're penny wise and pound foolish. It is our job as digital forensics experts to educate them and to help them understand. Okay, you do want seat belts, right? You gotta put it in language they understand. You want, you want an airbag when you're operating with that technology, don't you? Oh, you have a credit card machine? But, but look at how you're connecting it. You know you can go to jail if people's credit card numbers get away from you, right? You do know that. That's one of those things that we do that is not really emphasized in many cases, and I'm emphasizing it now. Put another way, forensic investigators are part of a team. The whole idea is you're not an island unto yourself. You have a greater purpose and you serve the team, right? Okay, now when it comes to formal criminal investigations and digital forensics on a criminal scale, they also talk about this investigations triad, right? So you have digital investigations that the forensic experts perform. You have vulnerability, threat assessment, and risk management. This is proactive digital forensics to discover exposures. And then you have network intrusion and incident response. You have specialty, you have specialties within digital forensics where things are happening very fast with network forensics. So you can catch and respond to intrusions in real time. Okay. Does everybody see what I'm talking about here? Yeah. 
Okay. Now this is critical because if somebody's lurking and they're local, then local laws apply. If they're international, well, your mileage may vary about whether or not you get a chance to, you know, stop them from doing some things. But you can shut them down, even if it's international. Never mind the legal. Still good information to know. Oh, hey, somebody from an island, from somebody from Down Island is messing up our network. Mm. All right, so maybe you don't have options for law enforcement, but you know who they are and what they're doing. So you just barrage TCP resets at them. So their technology is completely useless. Mm, maybe. Depends on context. Depending on the organization and what's going on there, you could wear prison orange because you can be charged with infractions based on their laws. It gets to be a little complicated when you cross international boundaries. Uh, so the author of our textbook explains a little more about each of these three, right? Um, we focus largely on this, but we're gonna be doing some of this. Well, actually, we're going to be doing a little bit of all three. So you are going to be doing some forensic assessments. You are going to be doing some network forensics. And uh, we're going to be doing traditional digital forensics as well, all three of those types, before the course is over. So uh, in the 1990s, the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists introduced training on software for digital forensics. One thing that we expect if you're a digital forensic expert is that you belong to, you're a member of one of these professional organizations. Some include certifications and standards. Others are just professional memberships where colleagues can share and troubleshoot and consult with each other in challenging circumstances. If we're gonna beat the bad guys, sometimes it takes more than just one set of experts. And being a member of these organizations means that you have additional expertise on tap. Even if you don't know how to use a digital forensic tool, somebody in that organization usually does. And so you do a lot of courtesy consultations. You know, you return the favor. Maybe you're an expert in network forensics and the other person is uh, a subject matter expert when it comes to steganography, where there's hidden data inside digital images. And you trade, you trade favors, right? Which is perfectly legitimate. You also get tax write-offs for that too. But just because you do something as a courtesy doesn't mean there isn't a benefit. You get to write that off on your taxes, right? Uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service created a search warrant program, right? Now the IRS is, IRS is ruthless and they have some of the best digital forensic experts in the world. Why? Because income tax evasion is a thing. Put another way, if you or someone you know is into shorting people for the taxes that are due, you might wanna share with them how the IRS is particularly gifted at catching up with folks Oh, they don't do it right away. They wait until you hang yourself and then there's penalties. Oh, and there's interest on the penalties. So maybe, maybe an individual absconded with a $5,000 tax benefit they weren't really truly owed. Within three years, the interest on the penalties that accrues, that 5,000 becomes 75,000. And they come after your house, they confiscate your cars. I want you to understand this. One of the largest employers for digital forensic specialists is the IRS, right? Just something to think about. ASR data, all right, so now they're talking about specific applications for a given platform. On the Macintosh platform, ASR data is a commonly used one. Uh, access data has a forensic toolkit, will, become fairly familiar with that. We're gonna use a lot of open source stuff. Uh, here it is, IRS again, right? There was a famous mobster, Al Capone in Chicago. He owned the city. Nobody could get him on anything until the IRS found out that he was lying about his taxes and he went to jail for the rest of his life because he claimed that he earned $200, but he lived in a mansion, drove, $100,000 cars, 
and owned million dollar businesses. So how is it you only earned $200, right? Just a thing there. Any questions? How did, yeah, how did not figure that out? Uh, the numbers didn't add up. In modern day terms, we would say that the forensic accounting, so there's a, there's a specialty branch of digital forensics called forensic accounting. That's a great question. So forensic accountant specialists are dual certified, both as certified public accountants and as digital forensics experts. And there is a certification for forensic accountants. And as, to make a long story short, they're gifted at finding out, okay, these numbers don't add up and then finding out exactly what's going on. It's a common infraction and in some cases a felony for people to cook the books. It's called cooking the books. You mess with the numbers and you screw up the information so that your financial reports are off. And then in that confusion, people make off with all kinds of money. And that, that is a common repeating theme in digital forensics. So what do you do when, when uh, statutes and regulations, uh, so you have laws that Congress passes or the legislature passes, then you also have statutes or regulations that the executive branch, the governor or the president issue themselves. Those are called statutes or regulations. And then there are cases where, okay, there's a gray area, there's no real law for a thing and it goes to court. This is called case law. And the outcome of a court case is often used to, well, it, it eliminates the ambiguity in the law, but it also provides a basis for improved operations. What am I saying? If there's a decision in a courtroom that, hey, this forensic method is flawed, then you can count on a lot of other court cases using that same forensic method to be tossed. Let's repeat that. If there's a, if there's a court case where a forensic method is tossed and it's defeated for technical reasons, meaning the validity of that forensic method is challenged and then refuted in, and it's and the court upholds that decision, it means that the same forensic method used for future court cases can be, well, can be dropped or excused because, hey, in this court case, we said that this forensic method is, you know, it's no longer valid. So everything else that follows, it just gets tossed, right? So what am I saying? I'm saying that if something happens in Florida and it's a federal case and it's tossed, and then here in the Virgin Islands, we're unaware of case law that, that uh, basically eliminated the, a certain forensic method as a valid tool, then it can be tossed in the Virgin Islands based on precedent. It's called precedent. You may have heard the term precedent. That means Oh, there was a court case and the court decision was upheld, even if it was challenged. And that means, well, if you do it, yeah, yours will get tossed also. So examiners must be familiar with recent court rulings on search and seizure in the electronic environment because it's always changing. A single court case can change everything overnight. It's kind of like finding out that a cop is crooked and there were 10 people that were sent to jail for life but then you find out the cop is crooked. What do you think happens to the 10 people that are in jail? Do they stay in jail or are they exonerated and released? Because now the decision to incarcerate 10 individuals for the rest of their lives is unreliable. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? A little bit. Yeah, same thing happens in digital forensics, right? So another great uh, professional association is the Computer Technology Investigators Network. Uh, this is just a great way to loop in additional subject matter experts. We've talked about different levels of investigations. We talked about public sector investigations and private sector investigations. When you're doing 
an investigation in the context of an organization that is a private organization that is a private sector investigation. What am I saying? Nonprofit organizations, businesses, enterprises, even single person businesses, right? Consultancies, that kind of thing. Those are all private sector investigations. What happens when you do an investigation for an agency of the VI government? Is the VI government a private or public organization? Please, someone. The private. Um, so a bunch of private people in a club get to decide what happens? Or do the public citizens get to vote and then they and then they have representatives who do laws? Which is it? Yeah, that sounds better. That's the latter one, right? Yeah. So VI government, I'm glad we're going through this. The VI government is a public organization. Any form of government is considered to be public. Why? Well, because you have uh, citizens and stakeholders who elect officials to manage and run municipal governments, city governments, county governments, state and territorial governments, national, international, all that. Anything that's that's public sector investigation. Now, public sector investigations can involve civil or criminal matters. So when we say criminal, we mean like jail or fines. When we say civil, we mean liability. Again, fines, but same thing, basically a monetary penalty. I circle back around like a big shark. Once again, context. Hello, another example of context makes all the difference. I'm in a private organization. I'm investigating with digital forensic methods. Now the law is broken. Who is in charge? Who covers that jurisdiction? Well, your government does. Now it's a public sec. It suddenly goes from being a private investigation now into a public investigation, right? So as soon as laws are broken, there are elements of public sector requirements that start to come into play. So it's dynamic. Rule number one, context makes a big difference. Rule number two, previous decisions in court cases make a big difference. Number three, and those are always changing. Number three, your investigation is subject to change at any moment. You have to be prepared for it to go full scale, full tilt, full on criminal. Because you can discover stuff you didn't expect, even in the most, even in the most mild mannered cases. Oh, something weird is happening with this computer. And that business is under contract with a federal agency to provide a service. And there was an exploit that bled into the federal agency. And there were felonies that occurred during the perpetration of such activities. And during the conduct of such activities, felonies were committed. Well, that's when you pull the chain, all stop, right? Subject to change at any moment. US Fourth Amendment in Canada, Article 8 protects rights privacy, unlawful search and seizure. Article eight in Canada is the equivalent of the US Fourth Amendment, better known as the Bill of Rights. Any questions? No. No, I want you to notice here, private organizations, right? Companies, Fortune 500 companies, they can be for-profit companies, litigation disputes. So why would you use uh, let's say you had a lawsuit, somebody was suing, hey, this product burned my hair. Now I'm, now I look like a, now I'm disgraced. I'm suing you. Okay, that's a litigation, that's a lawsuit. That becomes a matter of a civil proceeding where somebody is seeking damages against a company. It's all private. Now, if a safety law is violated where federal standards, criminal federal standards have been breached, now it's a criminal proceeding as well. Oftentimes, a civil proceeding will run its course 
and an outcome of the civil proceeding is referral to the criminal courts. This happens all the time. You get a lawsuit, and then during the lawsuit, there's something called e-discovery. The courts say, oh, so <laughs> the person who is pursuing this lawsuit says, you knew, you knew, and your employees tried to tell you that you don't, you need to pull this product from the shelf. It's burning people's hair. It's unsafe. It's causing problems. There have been complaints, but you buried this, right? The courts ordered that every email for every employee that could have been potentially involved before, during, and after this crap have to be turned over to the courts. That's huge and costly. That's called e-discovery. During the course of the e-discovery, you find out that somebody falsified documents associated with federal standards that include criminal penalties for falsification of safety, whatever, under the Food and Drug Administration Act, right, FDA. Bingo, now you have a criminal case, right? What are we trying to say? You have to have standards about how you approach every digital forensic scenario so that if it goes nuclear, if it goes full on, right, viral, a social networking equivalent of this is it goes viral. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. You have to be prepared for every scenario. Okay. Now, I want you to think about all of this in the context of the discovered smartphones for your in independent assignment, right? I mean, do you want to go poking? I'm just saying, all right, I'm, and I'm not going to say anymore, right? It's going to be a lively discussion on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Prepare for digital investigations. Public sector investigations involve government agencies, oops, responsible for criminal investigations and prosecution. The Department of Justice, right? They have a search and seizure standard. It's in your reference folder. I included the DOJ standard. I expect you to review it and look at it. There will be questions on your assessment. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay. That's why it's in there. DOJ. I want to keep you out of jail. There are some basics that are good to know. You don't want to become the poster child for how to screw up a criminal investigation, right? It's probably a good idea to be familiar with what the standards are. So if you go viral, just to use an analogy, you know, you're read up on that and you know what to do to keep yourself out of trouble. Private sector investigations focus more on policy violations. And this gets into an interesting tangle. I'm going to spend 60 seconds where I say something and I'm going to repeat it. And I want you to listen to this for posterity and it's not in writing and it's not on the screen in writing. It'll be audibly present in this recording, but I really want you to hear this. I really want you to hear this. Everybody repeat after me. I want everyone to repeat this word out loud. What is this word here? Policy. That was one person. Come on, let's hear the rest. Policy. Okay, that's two more. Come on, everybody. Everybody all the see. Policy. Okay, good. Policies are written standards in an organization. And here's what happens in a lot of organizations. They have a policy where they have a written standard, but guess what? They don't ever practice. They don't ever really practice the policy. They have a policy to look good because the boss man wants to make sure that they have standards, but they don't really honor the standards. They don't really give a crap about the standards. They don't give a darn. They're unethical. They're lazy. They're incompetent. Okay? Or all of the above. So, so here's what happens as a digital forensics expert. You're called in to help a company that is so hampered by its own unethical or inadequate internal process, right? And you're not a magician. Didn't I start by saying you're not wearing prison orange for anyone? 
Yeah. Right. So here's what happens. You have a private organization and they have a policy, they have a written standard, but they don't practice it. Guess what happens when this reaches any courtroom? Whether it's a lawsuit and it's private civil or it's criminal. Guess what happens when we find out that that hapless, poorly managed organization, private or public, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we're dealing with an agency of the territorial it doesn't matter if we're dealing with the governor's office of the U.S. Virgin Islands. That's just an example, but that's why I'm not putting this in writing. What happens is that the court looks at this and they say, let me see if I have this right. You had a written policy that you were supposed to follow, that you were supposed to honor, but nobody actually does it. Are you morons? You are all at fault. You are all... <laughs> You are all frauds. You have perpetrated frauds on the people who own the business you report to, right? This blows up in people's faces. What am I saying? This is a landmine of gargantuan proportions. You're talking to a guy who's been doing this for 20 years and I have stepped in it and I have, I have been fragmented in unholy ways, occasionally and unexpectedly over that 20 year time span. I'm telling you something now you will never find in a textbook, but I want you to know that if the first thing you want to ask when you walk in the door as a part of your digital investigation is, do you have policies and proceed defined procedures for the way you use your technology resources? And if the answer is <clears throat> yes, the very next question you need to ask is, okay, do you actually practice them? If you get a funny look or people go, um, yeah, uh, and they put on their dance shoes and they're like, well, what do you mean by that? You might not wanna sign a non-disclosure. You might not wanna serve that institution or that organization. You might wanna lean forward and go, look, I'm not wearing prison orange for anybody. I need to know if you, you say you have written policies and you have defined procedures, I need to see them. Okay, so if I look in your logs on your systems, when I look at the sys at these uh, devices and, and uh, PCs, I'm gonna see a pattern that shows you actually practice, you actually do your policies and procedures. And if the answer is funny or muddled, or I don't know, most of the time, I think, this is where you talk to stakeholders, the decision makers and the, the, the boss, the boss of that organization. And you say, okay, now I'm signing a non-disclosure agreement, but I'm not an insurance policy against incompetence. I'm getting a muddled answer about this. And I want you to know my limitations. I will perform digital forensics uh, methods on your behalf. I will write some findings and I will recommend some changes and it's up to you whether or not you implement those changes. I am not an insurance policy against incompetence and you need to be prepared for the fact that I have integrity and if I find something that's off I'm going to call it to your attention and I'm going to leave it to you. Provided it's not a it's not a violation of federal law, I'm going to leave it to your discretion to figure out how to clean up your own mess in house. But I don't want you to be deceived that this is going to be a warm fuzzy thing, and I'm here to make sure that I've got your back. You don't hire me to got you. I, you have to be ethical, and you have to let people know what your limitations are. Okay, so I am sworn not to disclose things that are discovered during my investigations that reflect general incompetence, neglect, or fraud. I'm going to report those things to you. If any, if any trigger a federal or criminal, I am obligated, and you know that, it says that in the NDA, but I want you to understand, I'm going, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. I'm gonna, I am going to report what I found and I'm gonna provide recommendations based on best practices. I'm gonna leave it to you but don't be shocked and don't try to talk me out of reporting the truth. If I find it, you're gonna see it in the report. 
do you still want me to proceed with my analysis? Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. And this is why I'm telling you this. You need to be prepared to push away from the table and say, you know, I know a colleague and I think he's better, he's a better fitted, uh, he's better suited for what you you need. Right? You need something informal, you need, you need some help. But I'm a professional. And that means I have standards. And if I see something that's going to bite you and hurt you, I'm going to mention it in my report. If there are things that you're practicing with your technology that are dangerous and you have an obligation to protect credit cards and you haven't gone to jail yet, but you will go to jail, I'm going to put it in the report because I'm not going to jail. When you lose the credit cards and you turn around, and you go, oh, but Tim, we called Tim in to investigate our technology to make sure that it was good. They're going to flip that. They paid you. They're going to turn it into, you know what happens to a drowning man? A drowning man tries to what? Tries to bring someone down with him. Anybody they can. They're going to try to stay to float any way they can. And my point is, is you have cases where people have paid you handsomely. But you know why they paid you? Because they think they can turn it around and flip it and say, well, it's really this person's fault, right? This is where the attention to detail, your documentation, and your method are the most important, okay? Now, the good news is there are professional objective ways to proceed, even in cases where people make honest mistakes. Oh, they had a policy and they had a, but they never got around to ratifying the defined procedure based on the policy. And they did some of those things, but they're still missing some. In your report, you can say, here's a problem that we discovered. Here's why it happened because the procedures related to this policy were not fully implemented. If you complete the implementation of these procedures as defined by the policy, you won't have a problem going into the future. And that's the record you provide. And, that's, and, the, and the people who hired you are gonna say, um, yeah, I don't really like the way you worded that. And I'm like, the hell you don't, of course you don't. But I'm telling you the truth. If you make the changes, you won't have this problem going forward. That's the truth. Those are the facts. And that's what I stand by. Oh, but, but, but the boss man's going to see this and then I'm going to get in trouble. And then we're going to have to spend all this money on what? So you don't compromise everybody's credit card so they can do business securely with you and go to sleep at night, knowing that their financial fortunes and their retirement aren't lost because you're stupid. Uh -huh. Look, I'm just trying to keep it real, okay? One of the dynamics of digital forensics is the human element. And it is by far the greatest wild card. You have to be prepared for anything, especially when it comes to policy violations. Again, I told you I'd repeat this. When you start with a company and you're beginning to serve them, after, before you sign your non-disclosure, you're going to have a conversation about, do you have policies in place related to this matter? If the answer is yes, do you practice or do you have in place defined procedures that are derived from this policy? Do you actually do it? If it goes to court and they don't actually do it and you knew it and you just helped them like clean up the mess, you can actually be charged as an accomplice after the fact. That's why I'm repeating this. You can be charged after the fact as an accomplice. If you basically gloss over that and you help them clean up the mess, but you're not truthful, you need, you will know a tree by its fruit. This is part of the Bible. It's part of our code of ethics. It goes all the way back to the uh, Hammurabi code or Hannibal code or one of those uh, ancient Babylon they had a ethical code or an ethical standard my point is is that you want to know up front what that is do you have procedures defined on the policy do you practice those procedures okay let's take a, do you still want me to proceed because here's what's going to happen if I proceed and I find out that some of these are being practiced I'm going to state in my report hey I have found that some of these measures have been practiced but 
this wasn't fully implemented and I would recommend that you take immediate action to adopt those additional measures based on your policy. That's the record that stands and it's subject to court review in a court of law that can come back to bite you. The people you are hire, the people who hire you need to understand that's how you roll. Why? Context is everything. Conditions can change and you ain't wearing prison orange for anybody. Am I speaking your language? Yes. Okay. All right, good. Any questions so far? No, no, sir. Okay, that's a big point. Don't ever forget it. Do you have policies? Are there defined procedures? Do you actually use the defined procedures and practice them? When I get under the hood and I do my forensics, am I going to see a pattern that reflects that you actually do? Or are you a lion dog and you're not truthful to me right now? And in my report, you're going to be embarrassed and I'm never going to work with you again because I ain't wearing prison orange. I'm not your insurance policy for incompetence, right? Now, do I go in with guns blazing like that with a potential client? Hell no, I don't. I, half the people I'd talk to up front, they'd run screaming from the room. How do you handle this tactfully? Well, you know this going in on the front side and you're prepared to have those conversations with your stakeholders and you practice, you rehearse responses to annoyed, irritated or uncertain individuals who hear this kind of information. It's part of the game, okay? That's where you separate the sheep from the goats, the true professionals from the wannabes. Okay. We know we're going to come into awkward situations. The fact that they're hiring you after the fact, it's post-mortem. The patient is dead. There's damage and blood all over the floor. They have to have a digital forensic specialist. Most organizations never hire a digital forensics specialist to consult to prevent a thing. They only hire one out of desperation after the fact. Somebody is desperate after the fact. Put another way, if you're an ER medical person, if you're an ER doc and your specialty is trauma medicine, when people present in the emergency room, half the time, they're desperate. They're in a bad place. They're not in a good mood. They are not pleasant, okay? So I could be warm and fuzzy about this and blow sunshine up your backside about how cool digital forensics is. But if you know going in, that you can be that ER doc in digital terms, that you're a, you have the digital skills of a trauma surgeon and you're ready to roll up your sleeves and help that patient live, you'll be a rock star in the digital forensics world. And it won't be long before law enforcement agencies and everybody else try to hire you. The best paying, jo the best paying jobs in digital forensics are corporate jobs because they don't ever want to go to a lawsuit and they don't want to violate federal standards and they have the resources and deep pockets to do it. Law enforcement agencies are the next most common source of hire for digital forensics expertise, but you really have to know the law backwards, forwards, and inside out. And when they see your stewardship of these cases, they'll go, hey, that's somebody we want in our court. And they'll try to recruit you. And I will tell you that there is nothing more satisfying than serving the public interest for government and law enforcement, because you're doing something for the greater good, not because you're gonna get rich, but because we can all sleep at night and we can use our credit cards and we have some kind of privacy and the bad guys don't win. So there are pros and cons to each opportunity, but I wanted to talk up a little bit more about this so you're aware. This thing here, right? So there are specific state laws that were generally developed later. If you wanna do something really special in this course, it might be a cool thing for you to do an independent research project. What are the territorial laws that are now enforced? What is the previous case law that has been decided in courts in the territory with regard to digital forensics? That would be fascinating. I'm not sure anybody's ever done that. In any case, when you're doing public sector investigations, you need to understand the law and computer related crimes. That's why I'm bringing this up. When you start doing public sector investigations, they're gonna say, hey, we need a consultant. You're a subject matter expert, you're certified. 
Um, we need your help. So you got to be up on all this, right? Remember the federal standards count if the territory doesn't have them. The federal standards count if the territory doesn't have them. All right, following legal process, a criminal investigation usually begins when someone finds evidence of or of or witnesses a crime. Sometimes you can see evidence of a crime live on screen. You become that witness. Hello. One of the tried and true principles of digital forensics is that you have a camera and you videotape everything you're doing or somebody else is in the room as a witness. Okay, so if you're a witness or you become a victim, then you can make an allegation to the police. The police interview the complaint, write a report about the crime, and depending on what they find out, they can actually start charging a person. Once they charge a person, it might go to court. If it goes to court, there might be a jail sentence or penalty. It's quite a process. I would advise you if you want to get into the digital forensic side of work, and you want to do it as a specialty that you also take some courses in criminal justice at our campus. Any questions? No. Remember what I told no. you? Digital, digital evidence first responder, digital evidence specialist. This is the incident handler on the scene. This is often an IT person who's been trained some things in forensics, but not a whole lot. Their primary role is to keep the the organization operating and preserve the evidence. They serve a dual role. Digital evidence first responders preserve the evidence, but not to the point where the organization can't operate. That's a walk on a tightrope. That's why incident handling is a subset or specialty of digital forensics. And it is now a full-blown, full-scale certification in its own right. Incident handling is a cybersecurity certification. DEFR is another word for Incident handler, IH. First responders, think of police, fire, and rescue, right? And then digital evidence specialists, those are the what? <laughs> the coroners, the ER docs, the trauma surgeons, right? That's, that's what we are. Affidavit, a sworn statement of support of facts about evidence of a crime must include exhibits. Have to include exhibits, your your chain of custody of the digital evidence is most important. That is our final note for this class. We will review as much of the remaining content as possible on Tuesday. And we're going to have a brief discussion of the, hey, I found a smartphone on the beach thing. I want you to understand this is where the rubber starts. This is where the real fun starts. When you have digital evidence, the first thing that happens is that you have to have, you have to use it as an exhibit along with a sworn statement. That means chain of custody is important. We'll pick up the trail on Tuesday with a brief review of chain of custody. Are there any questions before we close for the day? No, none, okay. none from me. Well, um, you're going to find that we skip a few slides and then we accelerate some things and we kind of drop around here and there and then we'll make sure that we uh, cover the study guide. It would be ideal if each of you could read the study guide straight through and then bring questions if you have any on Tuesday. Okay. Everybody got that? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us and I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, we'll sign off for now. All right. See you Tuesday. Stay safe. Stay healthy in the meantime. Bye for now.